But I can tell what Democrats are, uh, as far as like the Democrat Party. And I don't want to insult Democrat voters. Mm -hmm. Like the current Democrat Party is a small group of people that have bitterness and venom towards the United States of America. And they're willing to do whatever. God, that's sad. I don't come to that conclusion lightly. A, the Republican Party should be, but it's not should be an opposition party to that very unpopular agenda that is about American exceptionalism and a free society. So I'm a conservative. I could tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. A conservative wants to protect what is best mm -hmm. and wants to keep freedom and liberty as a primary character, as a primary feature of society. We do that through an appreciation through the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, a preference on states' rights because we believe that decentralized power is best, mm -hmm. laboratories of democracy. We saw that actually be one of our saving graces during COVID. Mm -hmm. We believe in free enterprise. That's a lot better than collectivist policies. Mm -hmm. We believe in strong families that are a bedrock to um, a totalitarian government. So you just mentioned Turning Point, yes. and uh, it was fun to go down to your show and see like the campus. Yes. It's, it's, you've created something enormous. How did you even like have the Forsyth or did you have it? Did it organically just grow into that size? Because you have multiple buildings down there. You've got chapters all over the country yes. in different colleges. And I think you're in high school. Are you yeah, high, school high schools and, as high well? School and college, yeah. I mean, how did that come to be? Yeah, it definitely didn't see it all at, you know, before it happened. Just super, super blessed, super lucky. Um, and, you know, I've just been kind of dedicated my whole life to it over 11 years. It started just with me and, you know, one or two other people and this kind of crazy idea. But I mean, I love this country. One of the reasons I love this country is you can create big and amazing things when you literally start with nothing and go from zero to one. Uh, I think Turning Point's a great example of that. And we, from Turning Point Academy to uh, what we do online, to my program, to the podcast, to America Fest, to our Young Women's Leadership Summit, uh, to our Turning Point Action, to the ballot chasing program, we've kind of built a machine. We got like 600 full-time people now. Um, yeah, we have to, you know, raise between 80 to 90 million dollars a year, which praise God we're able to do. Um, and we have over 300,000 people that donate to the organization. And then, of course, the, the media wing on top of that is, is yeah. pretty substantial. But only in America is a story like that possible. How do you how do you do that? How do you raise almost a hundred million dollars? Uh, relentlessly asking for money. Uh, no, is we, it all donations yeah, or is all, there? Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of program revenue, like we'll charge for tickets sure. at America Fest, but we, right. we barely break even for that, right? Okay. So um, yeah, it's, it's almost all, all donors. I mean, we have an amazing group of, I'd say three to 400 big donors mm -hmm. that I've gotten to know and nurture over the last decade. And they're, they're unbelievable. They're the best group of people in the country because there's, in politics, people always like to insult donors. Mm -hmm. uh, we have awesome donors and they're yeah. just so patriotic and they're so great. And then we have, you know, 299,000 small dollar donors, five bucks, 10 bucks, 50 bucks. And that, that's one of the larger small dollar donor armies in the entire conservative movement mm -hmm. that uh, we've built. So, and then, um, yeah, we just produce and we prove value and donors gravitate towards us. And it's kind of just been a momentum, you know, effect over the five to six years ago, I'd have to call people. They had no idea who we were, no idea what we're doing. Um, now they all have an opinion of us. The problem is, is it <laughs> or positive bad? or negative? Yeah, which honestly I prefer. I right? think that's better. It's way better. It means you stand for something. And they also know that we're impactful, right? I mean, I just had a conversation with a very wealthy person, um, loves the country, you know, thinks we're too aggressive. I said, that's fine. You know, you, I, I think it's effective versus aggressive, but he didn't doubt our impact. Right. Mm. And so um, it's much better than when you have to get on the phone and be like, well, let me introduce myself. And because there's just it's, you're trying to go from you know, nothing to something. So I've been super blessed. And, uh, yeah, we're we're the leading organization now in that space. I bet you are. I want to, like, excavate a little bit more of this donor situation and the way that the money comes through to be able to do it, because it's going to lead into one of the things that I am the most interested in understanding sure. and think is almost the most useless, which is this partisan politics stuff. It feels just, it feels messy and unnecessary. Um, so you get these donors, do you, do they, are there, are there any lobbies on their side? Like I look at donors and I think because they give you money, then you have to do something. And that's how politics get yes. corrupted along the way. So how do you, I don't know if that's true, but I really no. don't think that happens well, no, no, with you. With us, so that's how not do you the case. do it then? But uh, it could be the case. I mean, if I sure. wanted to raise a lot of easy money, I'd go and set up an office in DC and take money from the pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. take money from the war industry. Mm -hmm. But I mean, my opinions don't jive with that number one, nor would I be able to live with myself. But, there, but it's a great question, Danica, because a lot of the nonprofits in the conservative space, yeah. that's how they raise their money. 
But there's another pool of money that has always been untapped, which is super successful mid to large size business entrepreneurs that love the country and give for the right reasons mm -hmm. that are in the front row of America Fest. And you might not realize, but like that guy's a billionaire and he's just like screaming at the speakers and in a good way, like loves the country. Yeah. So there's kind of two types of different major political donors. There's one that wants access and favors and those people generally give the political campaigns. That's easy money to raise. Mm -hmm. They're transactional. Mm -hmm. And I've been around those people. They're not necessarily bad people, but they're there for a business purpose. Yep. And they have a very specific um, light item in the budget, very specific cause that they want to see fulfilled, whether it be more money to Ukraine or they want to see mass vaccination campaigns. Then there are patriotic donors that deeply believe in a value system mm -hmm. and they've built a business, they're worried about their kids and grandkids. We have been super blessed to flourish in that space. And we're unusual because most organizations on the right only play in the easy money space. But then you're mm -hmm. purchased. Mm -hmm. And it's kind exactly. of like being a NASCAR driver, right? You have to wear all your different sponsors. <laughs> and But again, I know yeah. a lot of those people in that space. And every yeah. so often they'll make an attempt to try to come to us. And then they realize our opinions don't drive. And or I'll say like, Look, I guess I'll take your money, but like I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. And then just the conversation. So it's clear. Yeah, the conversation just kind of ends. And like, yeah. there's really no money that get, that goes from that point forward. But your concern's a legit one. Yeah. Um, but I also want to make sure it's clear that donors gets called as like a pejorative bad term. I totally get it because I would say the majority of donors fall into the access or favor category. Sure. But an untapped group that does deserve appreciation are these people that, you know, they're worth 20 to 30 million dollars. They're not billionaires. They built like a mid-sized manufacturing company in like rural Iowa and they want their grandkids to live in a free society. Hmm. And like th those are the people that generally predominantly support Turning Point. High integrity. High integrity. They're not like they're not there for special access. They just want their country back. Yeah. And honestly, I love those people because they're doing with their resources what they should do, yeah. which is not just go buy a private jet or a yacht, yeah. which is nothing wrong with those things inherently but they're giving a lot of their resources very generously back to the country. Feels a little like tithing. Yes, no, and honestly, some of them look at it through a pseudo-moral, I don't want to say religious, but some of them look at sure. it as this money is put aside for a charitable endeavor that fulfills a moral good greater than I am. Yeah. Um, not as if it's like, hey, this is part of my budget to make sure, sure. that Congress approves <laughs> $30 billion to whatever stupid project I want. Mm -hmm. The dirtiness of politics goes through that vector. Mm. And so I, 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 I totally understand and share the con, you know, not just the concern, but the point. Do you think it's possible for um, someone that's running for office all along the way to be able to make it very far without taking easy money along the way? Yes. Yeah, and Bernie Sanders, to his credit, did a pretty good job of it. Hmm. Um, is he independently wealthy? Or no, no, no. He just no. had a bunch of small dollar donors. Mm -hmm. Trump, to his credit, does a pretty good job with that. He has to, he has to accept some of the easy money because you just have to compete. Biden is like the king of easy money. Um, <laughs> he is. I mean, it's just like every major industry yeah. that wants to get access to the federal government, he's willing yeah. to sell himself for. He's, yeah. he's effectively a prostitute running in politics. And I hate to use that graphic language, but every single major policy position that he holds is a favor that he has traded for either political donations or cover from the far left, one of the two. Um, but it is possible. And again, I'm not a fan of Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. I don't like his politics at mm -hmm. all. I also think he sold himself out, but he was the rightful nominee of the Democrat mm -hmm. Party in 2016 mm -hmm. and probably 2020 if COVID didn't interrupt it. Um, but to his credit, his average contribution was like $26. Oh my God. You could fact check it, but I'm, I'm approximating. Yeah, yeah, it was like 26 yeah. to $40. Incredible. Unheard of. Yeah. Um, and so it is possible, but you, again, there's nothing wrong with getting big contributions if the people giving the money are there for the right patriotic reasons. But when you start to get into the higher thresholds in American politics, especially the nonprofit space where I'm in is one thing, especially though in political campaigns, here's how it works in DC. Let's say I'm a senator from Arizona, I'm Mark Kelly. I can fly to Arizona, meet with a bunch of donors that love the, love the country and really share about values, or I could be in DC, take an Uber to one of the country clubs there, and a lobbyist will set up a, an event with 150 attendees and every single one has maxed out a $2,700 contribution for you. And it's one speech, one event, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Of course they're going to do that. It's yeah. super, e as I say, it's easy, yeah. it's simple, it's accessible. Again, they'll do a little bit of that where they'll do the little of the pressing the flesh and meeting people. 
but it's, it's, the, the American political system is fundamentally broken because the way we finance our campaigns is, is to whomever wants the access the most. And as the government grows and the spending grows, then companies want to get access to that $6 trillion budget. So it's in their rational self-interest to try to give more money to get access to these politicians. And that's what they do. And it, it is pay for play. So to answer your question directly, it's possible, but it's not probable because it takes more work and or you have to then take positions that are so at odds with the donor class. Again, I use the donor class with the type mm -hmm. of donors that I carve mm -hmm. out as an exemption. Let's just say the oligarchy. It's important to me that the supplements I take are the highest quality. And that's why for two years, I've been drinking AG1. Unlike many supplement brands, AG1 is researched and developed by an in-house team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionalists with decades of experience in their respective fields. So many people have asked me if AG1 is actually the real deal. And trust me, there's a reason why I've been drinking it every morning for so long. Quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword. It's a commitment backed by expert leading scientific research, high quality ingredients, industry leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. I know I can trust what's in every single scoop of AG1 because of this meticulous process they go through. Taking care of my health shouldn't be complicated. And AG1 simplifies this by covering my nutritional bases and setting myself up for success in just 60 seconds. AG1's ingredients are heavily researched for efficacy and quality. And I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut health. I've partnered with AG1 for so long because they make such high quality products that I genuinely look forward to drinking every single morning, first thing in the morning. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D plus K2 and Five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription at drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way. Right. As <laughs> like the that. oligarchy. Now, what does the oligarchy want? They do want a corporatist model where big corporations can control your bodies. They can control what you consume, control what you eat, control what your children learn or consume. And these are multi-trillion dollar industries collectively. And if you take positions that are opposed to those, they won't finance you. They'll actively try to destroy you. And the only alternative will be then millions of people giving you small dollar donations. Mm, making it difficult. Do you think the days of career politicians is kind of over? Because it seems like there's an emergence of more business people coming through. I mean, Trump is one of them, right? Yes. Like a businessman that gets into politics and feels a calling or of a vague even seemed like a little He's amazing right so yeah you, should you know have him on the show. i'd, I'd yeah. love to he seems very interesting and Super honest smart. and open yes, just just like you um so do you think that career politicians that their days are numbered i sure hope so i mean because that's what Biden is, right? He's a total career uh, he, politician. He, so from just even idea, like I'm 30 years old. He's been there longer, I mean, longer than my lifetime. Yeah. He's been in D.C. Yeah. He has been in the Senate since like 1978. You can fact check me on it. But he was like 28, 29 years old when he first got involved in politics. 30 or 31, he first got elected as a senator from Delaware. Here's the problem with career politicians. They never created value in the marketplace. Like they've never actually had to prove themselves outside mm. of favoritism, outside of access to power. Right, to actually do something. Yeah, so to distill it, this is an oversimplification, but in life, you can either get money through merit or good ideas, or the inverse through access and like a secret society and corruption. So merit or corruption. So when you meet a rich person, outside of just money being handed to you from like a parent, you could easily break them into one of two categories. Yeah. Did you make that money because of merit like you worked your tail off, you woke up earlier, you put in a bunch of hours, or through corruption, you were really good at running a system. Mm -hmm. And you were really good at trading favors. And increasingly, the wealth in this country gravitates towards people that are very talented at the corruption game. The wealthiest counties in America, eight out of 10 of them, are around Washington, D.C. Mm. It used to be, mm. 50 years ago, Chicago, New York, L.A., you know, Ohio, Detroit. Really? So the wealth centers in this country have gone away from places where we manufacture products, where merit would triumph, 
and to a small set of counties where corruption reigns supreme. Stress is a common factor that affects everyone in today's fast-paced world, leading to various issues. What if the answer to better stress response is in a key ingredient? I'm talking about magnesium. Actually, I'm specifically talking about magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers. This one-of-a-kind product is designed to reverse low levels of magnesium, which could be leading to a multitude of health problems. What sets magnesium breakthrough apart is its ability to support healthy levels of stress hormones like cortisol, a better balanced stress response in your nervous and hormonal systems, and a healthy production of GABA, the relaxing neurotransmitter leading to a more peaceful and better flow state. That's why I recommend Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. It's the only organic full-spectrum magnesium supplement that includes seven unique forms of magnesium for stress resilience and better sleep all in one bottle. Simply go to bioptimizers.com slash pretty intense using promo code pretty intense. There are always amazing gifts with purchase. Go now to bioptimizers.com slash pretty intense to get your magnesium breakthrough and find out this month's gift with purchase. And so if you were to kind of go to a country club in Virgi like Northern Virginia, mm -hmm. the majority of them would either be employees of massive companies that live off of government contracts or lobbyists that make those government contracts possible. And you have to ask the question like, what value are you creating? Like, did you create a cool little widget? Like, did you invent an iPhone? Yeah. Did you do something meaningful where people's lives could be enriched? Like, no, they played the game. Yeah. Do you think that lobbyists should even be allowed? I mean, that's a difficult question because it's technically protected by the First Amendment. But, like, there needs to be serious reforms. I have, like, crazy ideas to do that. Like, I don't think that, I think that there should be a restriction on the amount of lobbying. First of all, I don't think lobbyists should be able to give the political campaigns. I think that solves some of it. Sure. Secondly, um, I think that lobbying hours need to be publicly disclosed by law. Mm. So there should be some sort of form or fashion how mm. lobbyists communicate to lawmakers. Mm. I don't know how that works, but some creative person can figure that out. Like Not to, dinners or offshore yeah, yachts or Exactly. <laughs> Secondly, there needs to be some sort of a family fencing in, which is how a lot of this works. So if they can't give the campaigns, they'll hire the wife or they'll hire the husband, which is they, they share a bank account. It's effectively the same, right? So it's like, okay, I can't hire Senator Mark Kelly, but you know, I'll go put, again, his wife's been through a lot, Gabby Giffords, but I'm just using that example. Yeah. I'll go put whatever person you have in that life. You know, example is Bernie Sanders' wife, right? So Bernie Sanders' wife ran a college in Vermont and I'm sure has been a recipient of a lot of favorable contracts and a lot of graft mm -hmm. associated. Um, this, this is the modus operandi of DC, which is the spouse becomes the clearinghouse of all of the dirty money. It's like laundering through the Yeah, and again, I don't ish. want, yeah. I, you know, it is. I, I totally agree. I just want to use like super yeah, precise I language. I will, I'll use. No, no, I do, I just, <laughs> it, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's no, because they share a bank accounts, so they can live like a really high society. Nancy Pelosi's another perfect example, right? Nancy Pelosi's stock portfolio was up 65% last year. Yeah. 65%, I would love a 65% return. You would love a 65% yeah. return. How is that possible? Well, first of all, her husband runs a major wealth management firm and is able to pick the stocks like the best of them, but she's trading on information. She knows what pieces of legislation are going to be pre you know, preferential. So again, this, I'm painting like a yeah. really dark picture. This is fixable, though. It's fixable if the- Dark or true. The what? Dark and true. Y yes, no, that dark and true. Yeah, right? It's a dark picture. But oh, yeah, 100%. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I, I misunderstood. Yeah, it's a dark picture, but it's a true picture. Um, it is fixable, but the problem is that as the spending in D.C. gets to be so enormous, the incentive structure for companies gets away from innovation and gets away from risk-taking mm. and goes towards just who do I have to purchase, who do I have to bribe, and I will use that word, who do I have to, you know, let's just say, get to know, yeah. because it's easier to get a earmark on a $6 trillion federal budget, $6 trillion, than it is to go create a new company where you might get sued, you have to hire a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So the incentive structure mm -hmm. to get rich mm -hmm. is now go play the corruption game rather than go create the next big company. Right, right. So how often do we see someone getting into a high status office or president that really is the person that, like it's them that's getting into office versus 
a group plan, yes. yeah, a, a, a stand-in, a, a puppet, a someone, a mouthpiece or a face piece even to some degree because yes. they can't talk well. Um, but what at what point in time do you think that that's normal that the person that ends up in that political position is actually more of a group than it is an individual? Almost certainly. I think Trump sense. was the I think Trump was the exception. I think he was his own person. And I could prove it just based on how they treated him when he got there. Mm. Through the, to the two impeachments, trying to target his entire team, of course now facing 700 years in federal prison. I mean, he was his own person and he refused to kowtow. They said threat after threat after threat after threat and he refused to capitulate to them. I'm a friend of Trump, I know him really well, I'm super biased, I'm happy to talk about that if you want to. But say what you will, they don't put the full force of the federal government after people that play by the game. Yeah. Now, Obama was supposed to be insur an insurgent. I mean, I lived through Obama years, you probably remember yeah. really well. He was supposed to be a people-centered, populist retaking of DC. Mm. But Obama got the same warnings. Obama got the same intel agents that came up to him and be like, you better play the game. You better play the game. This is what they do. And they and say And why? It. Play the game, why? For example, like, don't challenge the CIA. Don't challenge the FBI. Like, don't challenge the intel agencies. Because we, there, there is based and effectively a super government over our government that exists, and it's the Department of Justice, FBI, CIA, Department of National Intelligence, and Obama was like, whatever you need, effectively, and mm. he's like, so I get to play president, and you guys do what you do, and I'll do a couple of my campaign promises, but we're not going to touch the intelligence apparatus in this country. Mm. And that's effectively the deal that was struck. But understand, when Obama ran for office, he was running on some very righteous causes such as we're going to close down Guantanamo Bay. Never did that, right? That we're going to fix the government spying on American citizens. He expanded that power, oh right? God. We're going to end the endless wars. He invaded and declared more drone strikes on more foreign territory than anybody. So he, had, he ran in some righteous causes. Trump, to his credit, just on the foreign policies thing, no new wars, which was amazing, and we had a relative place of peace and harmony. Now we have war in every theater in the, country, in the world. It's just a fact. Secondly, they viciously attacked him, the intel agencies did. I want to just re remind your audience here, and again, your audience might not like Trump. I'm not here to apologize for him. There's plenty of things that we go through that I think he could have done differently. But I will defend him to the core, and obviously I want to see him reelected. They spied on one of his phone calls. Remember, the first impeachment was a transcript of a private phone call he had with no other than Zelensky, mm. the prime minister of Ukraine. And who leaked it? The intel community. The intel community leaked a private phone call that a president of the United States had with a foreign leader that triggered an impeachment. Could you imagine them doing that to Joe Biden? No, of course not. Well, it just shows the ranking of it all. Of course, <laughs> and because Trump was an independent thinker. He was analytically looking at this stuff, and he did fulfill a lot of his promises. And the, the, the imperial capital of D.C., the kingdom of D.C., the regime, does not like an insurgent. They want to run things the way they do, and so... The, the sooner the, your audience and the American citizen realizes we're living under something that far more resembles an oligarchy than a democracy or a constitutional republic, mm -hmm. that realization is a heavy one, but it's necessary of how we're going to proceed. Mm -hmm. You said you know Trump really well. Um, you know, everything that's going on and everything that has happened with how many indictments he's had. I mean, is, is what they're doing all, are they able to do it? Or are they yes, overstepping I mean, lines and pushing things through that are not really allowed? They're certainly overstepping norms. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to indict former presidents, period, regardless of what they do. Really? I mean, think about it. I mean, we just kind of turned an eye on Bill Clinton, and that's probably a good tradition, though. It's mm -hmm. probably not good to kind of go after former heads of state. That's literally what Nicaragua and third world countries do. Because yeah. then it just starts this back and forth tit for tat campaign where it never ends, and whoever has political power is just going to Diminishes the integrity of the country, of too, and, and we're, the, we don't want to look bad as a country. And we're already in a fragile position. I mean, sure. We're in a very fragile spot as a country, and I want to see us heal, and I want to see us come together. That's my heart. Mm -hmm. I don't like division. Mm -hmm. I, I have other things. I'd rather, like, be a college football coach. Um, not going to happen anytime soon, but, like, this is the civilization that's <laughs> You're headed more towards political office than you no, are I, towards I know, college but, football No, I know, but what coach. I'm saying is my, I, my heart... In yeah. certain ways, I have other interests outside of just totally. being a political animal. All the time. <laughs> but you know, to answer your question, some of what they're doing is not technically legal. It will probably be overturned on appeal. But they control the instruments of justice mm. in this country, and so who's going to mm. stop them? That's mm. kind of their attitude. Mm. 
But when you have a former president facing 700 years in federal prison under four different indictments in three different jurisdictions, two federal cases, one in Georgia, one in New York, not to mention them seizing his business empire in the state of New York, your audience should just press pause and be like, even if I hate Trump and I think he's a terrible person, I think he's whatever, all the different, fill in whatever it is. I think that these indictments are not going to harm Trump nearly as much as it harms the integrity of the American justice system. I can't look at an indictment and believe that there's not corruption behind it now. Mm -hmm. And so, that's sad. So who's the real police then? I mean, it, well, the local police, I think, still has some integrity, but it's the oligarchy. It's that if you violate the norms and customs of the stated beliefs of the D.C. imperial capital, they will use the full force of the government to destroy your life. Back to a little bit about Democratic Republican parties. Um, what is what is what is a de Republican and what is a Democrat? It's like what is a woman? <laughs> uh, <laughs> this should be obvious, right? No, I, I guess mean, to some degree, look, but I'm I feel like it's evolved over time, and even people that would have considered themselves to be a Democrat in the past are like, I guess I'm a Republican no, now. No, and I, I I find these labels repulsive. I mean, I do vote yeah. Republican, and I think I could convince most people that are re reasonable to do that because it's a temporary vehicle, I think, for sanity in a free society. But I can tell you what Democrats are, uh, as far as like the Democrat Party, and I don't want to insult Democrat voters. Mm -hmm. Like the current Democrat Party is a small group of people that have bitterness and venom towards the United States of America, and they're willing to do God, whatever. That's sad. I, 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 it's true. I wish I, I don't come to that conclusion lightly, but through their actions, through their policies, through their stated beliefs, this is what they're doing. And a, the Republican Party should be, but it's not, should be an opposition party to that very unpopular agenda that is about American exceptionalism and a free society. So I'm a conservative, I could tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. A conservative wants to protect what is best mm -hmm. and wants to keep freedom and liberty as a primary character, as a primary feature of society. We do that through an appreciation through the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, a preference on states' rights because we believe that decentralized power is best, mm -hmm. laboratories of democracy. We saw that actually be one of our saving graces during COVID. Mm -hmm. We believe in free enterprise. That's a lot better than collectivist policies. Mm -hmm. We believe in strong families that are a bedrock to um, a totalitarian government. We love free speech, but we believe in every one of the Bill of Rights, the right to privacy, the right to the Second Amendment. Um, and that's what a conservative is in summary. And you know, we, we, I think, are actually a majority of the country. If it's summarized that way, outside of labels, like someone who wants a free society and not hyper-radical ideas. I mean, I get portrayed as being like a super radical, and I certainly have opinions on certain issues. They thought about that. Maybe no, of I course, but I mean, they thought I, was I, I certainly too, have, so. I have opinions on certain cultural issues that are not in the mainstream. I hope one day they do become in the mainstream. But at my core, I'm not a radical because I want the country I grew up in. Like the country I grew up in is people weren't talking about race all the time. Like right. we weren't trying to trans our kids. Like we had Democrats as neighbors and we got along really well and like no one cared. It was like completely irrelevant. Yeah, right, exactly. It completely irrelevant. Like there were other things other than politics, like politics wasn't the state religion of the United States. <laughs> and so when people call me like a radical right winger, if that means like recentering the country back to the country I grew up in, like okay, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I hope that answers the question on labels. I don't like labels. There's an old phrase, if you label me, you negate me. Because mm. then it kind of puts you in a box. It's true. But the, the tragic heavy reality is that the Republican Party is like the only vessel that can push back against some of this. And there's a ton of problems with the Republican Party. I literally do a three hour show screaming more at Republicans and Democrats. Um, because in the American system, politics is how a lot of, uh, is how political power is appropriated and uh, is allocated, I should say, not appropriated. And um, yeah, the, the Republican Party should be hopefully a voice for that, that worldview. Increasingly it isn't though. Do you think that there is a value to have two parties, to have, to have a Democratic and Republican party? No, I, have... I don't think it's a value, but it's kind of a catch-22. So if you start to establish a third party, the Democrats will never do that. So you likely splinter whatever opposition party you have, right. and then you lose the country. Well, I'm thinking about no parties. Like, yeah, why the, is there parties at all? Well, because you have values, right? Okay. So you have to have, I mean, I'll give you an example. I believe in a border. Like, mm -hmm. a, I think a southern border is like a good thing. Sure. They don't. So inherently, we have parties. Okay. Right? So, event, so parties should be contrast that in, it, in its core, right? And so in, if we voted on issues and if we had lawmakers that responded to the people, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't totally be necessary. But think of parties as like the values of San Francisco versus the values of like rural Texas. Mm -hmm. 
the mm -hmm. good news is that states' rights allow those two people to live in the same country together mm -hmm. peacefully. Mm -hmm. They're increasingly trying to like destroy, destroy the rural Texas voter, but yeah, parties are should be a reflection of worldview. And it used to be the Democrat and Republican Party were not that far apart, especially in the 60s and 70s, and now at least the voters have never been more apart. And then there's a uniparty regime, which I'm happy to get into, where like moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats basically vote identically and they just carry a corporate agenda. As far as the two parties and, and having their belief systems, but there's so much, they're not exactly the same in that they're different, right? So someone like myself, let's say, I and fiscally and, and, and the way I want the country to be run would be far more conservative, very mm -hmm. conservative, um, like a business. And then I would live my life in a little bit more of a liberal way. I think people should be able to, you know, gay marriage is fine to me, um, things like that. That doesn't fall under the conservative sort of category of thinking. So, but that's me. And I feel like a lot of people are like that where you have um, a mix of different beliefs. So. Can't we just listen to each politician, listen to each person that we want to be in charge and hear their bullet points of beliefs and go, you're the best one for the job, as opposed to saying, you got to fit into this bucket or you got to fit into this bucket. I love your idealism. That's great. Um, yes, that, that, but first of all, that is how people should vote, 100%. The problem is the current configuration of D.C. is one party either controls the Senate or the other one doesn't. So the, the structure and the form of government, you have to elect the Speaker of the House, so you end up caucusing and you end up coming together and you're like, okay, are there more reds or are there more Ds? Now, what you are striking at, though, is probably going to be the long-term benefit of RFK's candidacy, mm -hmm. which, again, I don't support his presidential candidacy mm -hmm. right now. I'm a Trump guy. I think he's done a lot of good for the country. I wish him well. We have big disagreements. However, is that if there is, or if there are more and more legit independent candidates, mm -hmm. that's probably that's probably going to break the two-party system long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's more possible in a social media era than it would have been thirty or forty sure. years ago. But as far as you do end up getting some form, and I, I mean, I, I think your value system is probably shared by most people. Um, I'm a social conservative, so but at the same time, I have no problem like saying that you don't have to agree on every single issue or topic. Here's where it gets to be scary, though, is you have these existential civilizational defining issues where it, you need to try to combine your support and call it something to oppose that. And so when the entire American Democrat Party is run like a mm -hmm. Soviet Politburo, and they think it's perfectly fine, and I'll give you just a, a mainstream policy platform of the Democrat Party, which is to give chemical castration to 13-year-olds under gender-affirming care, which is lunacy. for Even Britain thinks it's insane, right? Denmark, Sweden. Then you need some instrument to oppose that, right? And here's the sad, tragic reality. Not a single person who wants power in the Democrat Party is allowed to oppose that or else they kick them out of the party. Right. So they've consolidated all this power. I will say right, this, though. Right. Not that the Republican Party is perfect, but the ideological diversity in the Republican Party is far more robust than that in the mm. Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. There's a place for you in the Republican mm -hmm. Party mm -hmm. with the views that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. But if I, let's, if I were to say I'm a Democrat, which I'm not, and I'd say I believe in everything except I don't, I'm not on board for like the chemical castration thing, I would probably be kicked off the island. Mm -hmm. It's like pure party purity. It's absolute party purity. Where in the Republican Party, I could point to five members that have differences of opinion on all sorts of different types of issues and topics. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually probably a really good thing because mm -hmm. it's more, uh, let's just say, emblematic of the country. Yeah, it's a, and you have a conversation. Of so what Because what you're pointing to being the problem is that if you take and have a nominee that's, that doesn't fall under one of those or you don't have a Democratic-Republican party, but what you said is that when laws are trying to get passed, the reason why in, in different sections of government there's 
there's groups and they push things through. So what you're saying is that the parties are the problem still. Yeah, I mean, like, is again, essentially it's, like if something, if you're not on board with this one idea. And I heard Tulsi, I interviewed Tulsi Gabbard. And she, she probably was, said something similar. She was talking yeah. about, look, that you get a list of all the information and you say, these are the things and these, these are the, this is what's going to come up and this is how you're going to vote. And it's like, that's the problem is that we're not listening. Nobody's listening to what someone has to say or even able, able to say what they want to. Yes. They have to follow along with the course and path of the red or blue and if you want to stay in the in the group you have to follow yes. along and I, I would just encourage the one thing I would say is we as conservatives and I think we embody this we love dialogue we love disagreement you know if you want a free society like welcome aboard right you know we'll we'll duke out our differences I, I, I don't see that on the left. I, the, the liberals yeah. used to be that way. Oh, they really? used to be yeah. 20 or 30 years ago, disagreements are welcome, you know, we'll kind of figure this out along the way, and it's been a complete inversion. Right. It almost feels like like the Democratic Party used to be like sort of like a, everybody do your own thing, live love everybody, yes. love it, right? And now it's like if you don't it's if top you down say control. cancel culture rampant like yes. you, you know identity politics rampant like all of this stuff and it's very very isolating to their only beliefs like you said if you think one thing different than the rest of them then you're out and it seems flip -flop. how the hell did that happen i mean they are communists <laughs> i'm sorry they are i mean <laughs> communism doesn't allow dissent i I'm, I, I hate to like overly simple I but mean, how did that happen then yeah i mean they the ideological takeover of the universities of the culture and they also, they're able to combine and consolidate support by opposing the right as being fascists, as being, you know, anti-freedom types, which is the opposite. We're actually the freedom party mm. and we're the freedom movement uh, on every single issue that you could point to, um, except how they frame abortion, which I don't know if you want to get into or not, but like literally every single issue has its rootedness in liberty and freedom we're there about restricting that. I could literally go through the list. The type of stove that you want, whether or not you have Zin, they want to ban Zin. Electric vehicles, getting rid of traditional petroleum you know, gas mm -hmm. vehicles. Literally from your telecommunications to not getting a warrant to spy on you, to your Second Amendment rights, to your First Amendment rights that you have online, to mass censorship campaigns. I could go one by one by one. So you must get a vaccine or we're going to kick you out of the United States military. Mm -hmm. right? You must wear a mask on an airplane or else you are a super spreader. You're not allowed to visit a loved one who's dying in a hospital. Literally what happened to tens of thousands of families during yeah, COVID. So sad. Your kid is not allowed to go to school. You're not allowed to go to church. The Democrats have demonstrated themselves as being against a free society. Totally. As being against that. And so. And against cho your choice, your body. Yes, which is, which is so hilarious because that's kind of their big shtick, right? Exactly. Which is, you know, about abortion and all that. And I can also explain, yeah. you know, my philosophical opinion on that. But the, their whole thing was like, okay, we're never going to tell you what to do with your body, but now you must take a gene-altering mRNA shot that hasn't been tested and the studies were all super flawed. And if you get myocarditis or pericarditis, too bad, take the shot because it's safe and effective. Well, it wasn't safe, still isn't, and it certainly wasn't effective. Right. And Rochelle Walensky in a Senate testimony said that it will prevent transmission. That was a lie. She, she, she should go to federal prison for saying that. Yeah. As a public health official to say that it will prevent transmission. People heard that and they thought they would be safe from COVID-19, which certain populations were at risk from. In, and again, I'm happy to go down that road if you want, but instead of talking about monoclonal antibodies and ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and vitamin D and stop being fat and walking more and yeah. getting adequate sunlight, yeah. we said, go take this shot yeah. and everything's going to be fine, which was an absolute lie to the American people. Absolutely. And, and the question is, is how did they get away with calling it a vaccine? Which it isn't. I mean, it, again, it, that's an RFK, that's a Bobby Kennedy question, right? But they, the, sure. the, the, the capturing and the corruption, which goes back to one of our core themes of this conversation, is remarkable. And they wanted it, so they got it done. Mm -hmm. And uh, they pushed it through. And people are, still, people are still really damaged from it. So the connection that I'm feeling here is this, so this connection to who's really in control. Who's in Be charge? Who's really in charge. That, that is the question of the day, right? Because if you get like all, if you have this rampant cancel culture, if you're not able to say or do things, you have this censorship through all kinds of different means, whether it's television, getting fired, or potentially losing your job if you say something, or social media and Twitter having 75% of their 
their company be someone that was probably filtering out whatever they didn't want on the on on their on their platform. Um, it, how, who, and how are they able to make sure that they keep the narrative in control? Right, because it feels like they get the controlling narrative, right? Yes, yeah, they Similar do. to me, if I go to Amfest and say I love my country and something like that, they want to tear. You're me not allowed down. to love your country, Danica. They tear me down. It seems like you're a, a fascist for loving America. Core tenant of living here, to be honest. By the way, you handled that so well. You doubled down. Good for you. <laughs> Thank I you. Such respect for you. I would triple down. You no, know, I think it's great. Um, uh, versus someone that says, you know, allow you know drag queens into children's rooms and dance for them, right? Like Correct. how does that kind of thing happen and how how do you how do you get someone on TV that's able to positively promote a child that has even gone through puberty to be able to change their gender? Yes. Like how does that get through but then someone like myself saying like I love this country gets annihilated for it? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a very deep question. So how how do they control the narrative especially? Yeah. Well, they, they do control the main conduits of information. Mm -hmm. they, they control the major social media companies. God bless Elon Musk for what he's done with Twitter and, and or X, whatever we're going to call it. Mm -hmm. He's been a huge public service and moral good. He deserves great credit for maybe giving Western civilization Do you like him? Do you like Elon? Huge Elon fan, big time. Um, I, I don't agree with everything he's done. Who cares? I'm, I like, like a picture of Elon on my wall. I think he's amazing. No, I'm not kidding. I think, because he, we need more rich people to spend their money to save the civilization. Totally. Like that's period. With passion. And we need to, rich and people to spend, with passion. And to spend $50 billion for something that gets you literally investigated, maybe thrown in jail, be the most hated man in the West, where you don't make money and you're burning cash. Why do you do that? Because you believe in it. And I think that's awesome. Did you love when he was doing that interview? I can't remember who he was doing it with exactly, but and he basically told Disney to go fuck themselves. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, Bob Iger. Yeah, Bob, well, he was, yeah, he was talking about Bob was, was there. It was a CNBC. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Elon's tremendous. I'm happy to talk about. It. <laughs> we need more and more people that have significant wealth to rebel from the oligarchy to be a mm -hmm. class trader. Yeah. So Trump is a class trader. That's why I like him. I like people that turn their back on their class for the betterment of society. But to answer your question, it's incredibly deep, but they control the media. They also control who, is, who deems what is right or wrong. They control right. the fact, fact checking and kind of right. um, industry, and it is a whole industry that has been created. Uh, and they control the universities and the credentialing class. And to answer your question, as far as like the trans thing, the trans thing is a mass social contagion that has been made possible thanks to the advent of social media. Trans was not a big deal until 2013 or 14 with young people until every single young person had a supercomputer in their right hand pocket. And they frame it and they, they, it's primarily targeted at young girls and about 75% of quote unquote gender transition happens with young girls. Mm. Young, young girls are far more prone to fads and to social contagion than boys. They're far more social than boys. They're mm. far more uh, clingy to friend groups. So things travel very fast. In, um, and I, by the way, this is not like speculative as far, like let's just take one fad that was really big in the 90s, cutting oneself, mm -hmm. right? That was much bigger with young girls than it was for boys. Boys still did it, but young girls did it a lot more. Right. I could go through like 50 different you know, examples of that. And then it gets framed as a civil right. As they say, you have a civil right to transition as a minor, even though they likely have puberty anxiety that we've always treated this a certain way and then we give them chemicals. So how does that happen? That, that is a, that's a two-hour conversation, um, and it was launched on us, and we, we fell for the bait and fell for the trap, and that's part of the live and let live attitude that probably you and I both have. I mean, I have very strong socially conservative beliefs, but my attitude and my temperament is largely live and let live. Yeah. Like, I don't spend my time thinking about people's private lives. I just don't. Like, it doesn't yeah. really concern me. Yeah. But it's not live and let live. It's now live and let us rule. We're like, I have to use your pronouns. Yeah, and like yeah. my daughter one day has to go to a school and have some freak dance in front of her. Right, exactly. Like that's not live and let live anymore. Yeah, that's like a violation of the social compact that we had. Like the whole idea of like the modern movement around, you know, what they would say is gay rights is like just give us these rights and everything's gonna be fine. And like, and it's like turns out well, it's like a lot deeper and bigger than that. Mm. And it didn't stop mm -hmm. there. It's now mm -hmm. has like continued into this mass campaign to go after children. Um, and to normalize behavior, go after pronouns, criminalize speech, where you can get in more trouble in this country for 
vandalizing a pride flag than the American flag. It's considered a hate speech or a hate symbol. Oh my God. So I, I'm happy to go as deep into that if you, as you want. Yeah, yeah, I, as deep in any of this. I think <laughs> Sorry, it's all I, fascinating. I, I, no. I, I, no, it's I good. I talk for a living. So. I love it. No, yeah. it's fantastic. As you talk, I think about seven different things that yeah, I want to ask right. you about. You inter interrupt. So. And then we land. No, yeah. it's. Uh, I had to learn a long time ago when you interview to not interrupt. It's. Uh, it, it, I learned that very early. And I love to hear what you have to say and hear your thought process all the way out. I think that the one thing that stuck out the most that I wanted to talk about was just schools came up in my head a lot sure. and since you're so involved with schools and colleges and high schools and having your chapters I want you to talk about what those chapters what 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 that group is about what the entity what the what the mission is um, and then I want to get into schools because this is like a breeding yeah. ground for um, mass sort of manipulation and social contagion people. exactly so yeah we have the largest uh, we are the largest organization that fights for pro-American ideas on high school and college campuses. People call us conservative. That is probably a good description, but it's a lot bigger and deeper than just quote unquote conservatism. It's, it's really a belief that our history is one that's worthy of being proud of and appreciative of. We want a free society. We love the Constitution. We believe in free speech. We, want, we believe that every individual has a moral right to flourish and succeed without government getting in the way. And we believe in checks and balances, separation of powers. We believe that the federal government is way too big and should be restrained. So these are, you could call those conservatives. I think that's like normal American beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have uh, high school chapters and college chapters. It's an enormous footprint. Uh, people can check it out at tpusa.com. Uh, we have hundreds of full-time people that just work on this project literally every single day. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of members. You saw many of them at America mm -hmm. Fest. And it's just been amazing how that has grown. And through, as this work we've done, primarily in colleges, high schools are becoming even worse. But colleges have really become islands of totalitarianism. Um, every bad idea that you see in America, no borders, men can yeah. give birth, giving kids you know, chemical uh, castration drugs, they stem from the university. And the university is really the Wuhan Institute of Virology mm. of the woke mind virus. Love that. That's really good. It makes me think of even like uh, like Jordan Peterson, let's say, and how in Canada, like that's what essentially really launched him that's into correct. fame is uh, the pronouns and yeah, the, the, the compulsory speech yeah. exactly, and 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 that began in college, and because he was a professor. That's right. Yeah, and so our, our fight is not to change the institution. We believe the institution is rotten to the core. I wrote a whole book called The College Scam. So I'm happy to. Yeah. I mean, I have a GED, so yeah. I want. This is why I want to talk about school. Yeah, too. No, I, 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 I'm a high school graduate, right? Yeah. I didn't go to college, so I think college is a waste of time and it's a scam for most people. Um, maybe for like five to ten percent of careers, um, maybe like lawyer, doctor, maybe doctor, doctor, nurse, I kind of want you to see where to cut me open. Yeah, before exactly. You do it. I get that, but you know, if you're going to go study North African lesbian poetry, <laughs> not, not. Not necessary. Or business. Yeah. Or, just or, go or, start it. Or communication, right? No, I, I literally I, just sat with Bob Parsons, who well, he owns this whole thing. One of the most um, successful entrepreneurs. Exactly. In America, yeah. And he said, what you really need to do in business to be successful and what they teach you in school is completely different. There, <laughs> yeah. And I, I always laugh. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. We, we've, we, we're, we're almost close to a billion dollars of revenue over the last 11 years. Not every year, but you know, Crazy. we've raised a lot of money. Praise God. We have a huge staff and all this. And I laugh when kids say, I'm studying entrepreneurship. I said, you don't study entrepreneurship. You do, do entrepreneurship. It. Like, like there's nothing to study. It's in. like the default college it, degree it, that it, everyone goes to get because so, they're not really I, I sure know. what they want and they're not ready to move on. And they go, I'm yes. just going to go to school for business. Well, and, and I'm it's like, just so whole, you're not the, sure. The whole model of college is flawed. It, it, it's increasingly makes less and less sense to have a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds in their prime, like when they're the most sexually charged, live next to each other and expect them to learn. Like, okay, that's, that's really great. Um, so that, that whole idea. <laughs> to want to learn. Yeah, exactly. That, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's just kind of like a volcano waiting yeah. to explode. Uh -huh. Secondly, what are they actually learning? They're learning rubbish. They're not studying the great books. They're not exploring big ideas. And thirdly, you can do that for free or for basically no money outside of college. Oh, yeah. You can become as smart or as well informed on any topic you want right now. Oh my God, yeah. And, and that, that's you, have, you graduated high school. I have a GED. And I, have, I remember my most memorable moment the, where I finally had to decide that I was going to not say that I was dumb anymore because I just like to throw it away because I don't, owe, I don't know every historical um, date and stat about what happened. There's basic stuff that I don't really know. But I was walking along talking about 
this guy who worked at CERN, the Hydrogen Collider, and we were talking about physics and all kinds of stuff. And he goes, where did you study? And I was like, I have a GED. And he was like, yo, what? <laughs> That's right. So you can absolutely apply yourself. The internet is a beautiful thing. And you can learn and become educated in just about anything. And absolutely. there's all kinds of, I mean, not to bring Jordan Peterson up again, but he's going to, he's starting like an online yes. college working to get them as credits for you to learn at a far, far cheaper rate. And then you're not, I'm going to spiral here, but then you're not stuck in a debt hole Correct. that keeps you locked into whatever shitty job you had to take because you have to make money because you have this debt and you have to live and then you can't leave and you can't take a chance because taking chances means you might not make any money and you get stuck and you're on this wheel that you never get off of and it's a sad story and I'm not a huge promoter of college in any way. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an active you know, critic of it and I, everything you said is exactly right. And to add on top of it, parents are pushing their kids towards these universities and these colleges. Oh yeah. And it's 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 a very expensive risky credentialing exercise. It's to show me your piece of paper. And that piece of paper means next to nothing. It's also I think probably so the parents can be proud of themselves There's for getting their college and their kid into college and a good college, which is just an ego. Correct. If you go to any one of these neighborhoods here in Scottsdale, the they will cons the parents will consider themselves a success or not if they can go to the neighbor their neighbor and be like you know my daughter's at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter that your daughter became a son after one year of being at Stanford. <laughs> right. Doesn't matter if they hate the country. Doesn't matter if they're learning a bunch of rubbish. Right. But like they get to drive around in their Lexus with the sticker "Proud Stanford Mom." Right. That's like a marker of su success. On the inverse, if you go to you know AJ's or Bash's and you run into a neighbor and they say, "Oh, how's little Johnny doing?" Oh, he's a plumber. Mm -hmm. That's a mark of failure in mm -hmm. upper middle class American society. Mm -hmm. And that's a tragedy when you think about it. Mm -hmm. When You know what none of that actually captures? The character of a child. Amen. Is your child gonna tell the truth when it matters? Is your child full of integrity? Which is gonna lead to their happiness, which of is course. usually what a parent wants most for their child is yes, to be happy. Yes, and it's also a moral good for society. And yeah. so we have a bunch of kids, I'm not saying they're all bad or lacking in character, but it's not, it is by no means a primary concern of whether or not they're gonna, we're going to be creating good people, whether or not we're going to be creating people that are full of virtue and wisdom. So who's infiltrating the colleges? Oh, it's already infiltrated, yeah. But how? How um, do they do that? How do they get their narratives in and push through? And how do they um, indoctrinate all these kids into disillusionment of possibly just general objective truth? Yeah, I'm going to overly simplify it. but. The university was infiltrated by a bunch of radically bitter people that never built anything. They never built a business. They barely built a family. These are like the hippies that never grew up that were kind of, let's just say, upped up on psychedelic drugs, super angry at the country, but they found a home in the academy where you don't have to work very much. You could teach a class in some really weird, abstract, esoteric stuff, mm -hmm. and the kids just kept on coming. Mm -hmm. And these, the, the bad ideas were fostered and fomented from critical race theory to the idea of gender to anti-American to anti-colonialism. All this stuff comes so out of the university. are these the teachers, professors, the Professors, but I mean, understand professors have to, you know, they have to publish a certain amount. They have to constantly be writing. They have to constantly be, you know, they have to constantly be criticizing each other's work. So it kind of creates this, dare I say, a cabal. And it started with like a couple hundred professors and then it becomes a couple thousand professors. And there's just not that many professors in this country though, you think about hmm. it, right? There's just not, that, there's probably like 800 colleges that really are considered big colleges. And, hmm. you know, outside of like the social science, outside of like just science, math, engineering, you're talking about like six to 7,000 people. Hmm. It's not, it's not that much, that's not that many people that are in these industries that, that have an out, a disproportionate impact on American culture. Interesting. So you have six to thousand, again, there's more professors than that in America, yeah. but that's basically the ones that are educated, the majority of the kids, that, and we can get even, even, we can distill this even further. The Ivy Leagues alone have huge weight on American society or culture. Yeah. They're more likely to get into business or finance right. or top levels of American or government. Or become president. Yeah, exactly. So then, and then, so if you, how many Ivy League professors are there? I mean, m maybe yeah. like seven to 800 that are in the topics that we're talking about here. And that's like at the top level. So you have like Columbia, Dartmouth, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Penn. Um, I think I'm forgetting one. Brown, that's the last one, Brown. And th those collection of schools, you have a small, small subset of people 
that have a disproportionate amount of power over the American population and the American zeitgeist. So is it their curriculum that gets created no, or just their own personal beliefs that they that. infiltrate into yeah, the curriculum that then change the, the trajectory of these children's It's curriculum, beliefs. it's books, but it's more worldview that they develop, right? Huh. And it is at its core Marxist. It is at its core deconstructionist. And the worst of all of it is postmodernist, which if, depending on how deep you want to go, there was a small subset of radical professors in the late 50s and early 60s, from Herbert Marcuse to Jacques Derrida to Michel Foucault to uh, John Money, who came together and they had very radical views on nature and existence. I don't mean nature by like the plants and the trees right, right. and the sun. The nature of existence. The nature of existence. Okay. And you got postmodernism that came out of that. Huh. So they said you were living in modernity. Uh, what came before is antiquity, and we are now entering into postmodern times. And in postmodern times, uh, again, this was Jacques Derrida, who was really the pioneer. He wrote this in the book One Dimensional Man, where he believed fundamentally that there, this idea that there is a truth or there is a right way of doing things is completely and totally incorrect. Now, that, that's actually a fun thought exercise. Mm -hmm, yeah, there probably yeah. is some truth to that. Saying that there isn't an objective truth, generally speaking, and well, that we well, all hold our, that there is. Yeah, and I, I tend to disagree with that, but like it's fun to kind of juggle because some things do live in the, in the, in the gray area and some yeah. things do live in the approximate mean. But he then took that truth claim, which itself is paradoxical, right? There is no such thing as absolute truth, but and is that thing absolutely true, right? <laughs> so the whole... The whole premise is paradoxical, you know, and it's... It's his life, right. to be honest. But then you take it and then you apply it, and that's where deconstructionism comes, where you then must take everything apart, no matter how good it is. And they say, well, how do you know it's good? And what if somebody has a truth where they say they're a pedophile, and that's what they say is right or wrong? So you can extrapolate it to extreme fringes and radical, you know, mm. ideas in society. Then the outgrowth of that belief really resonated with people that were on the fringes of society and they mm -hmm. became professors. They mm -hmm. didn't fit into Western culture. Mm -hmm. They didn't fit into the norms of American life. Right, right. And they found a home in the academy where they could write complete rubbish. Now yeah. some of this stuff is like kind of fun late night conversations with your friends. Sure. But to adopt it as a worldview, let alone curriculum. Sure. Is a little aggressive. And especially the, the, the. This is more of a philosophical conversation than it is a teaching. Well, yeah, and they took that philosophical conversation. After you have experience and knowledge and can then do a good job of applying yes. it into your life in a mature way as opposed to a global way that could influence the fact that you might cut something off your body you'll regret about. Yes, or, or just even like acknowledging that maybe things are actually pretty good and you don't want to deconstruct everything. Sure. So the deconstructionism is the ideological bacteria that then tears everything apart. Hmm. So without going super, like way, you know, far back, deconstructionism posits that you must then take everything apart. America's racist. So you're saying take White everything apart, be, every little aspect you of what could be You must challenge the premise to... that people have. So let's say people love America. Well, no, you don't love America. It's systemically racist and the founders were slaves, slave owners. Do you love America? Though? Right. Or you might say, you know, for example, I might say, I, I believe the Bible is true. No, it's not. It's a bunch of mythologies. Whatever people hold on to as true, you must pick apart. You must challenge. You must question. You must deconstruct. Huh. And you might be in the audience be like, well, what's wrong with that? Be very careful if you don't have an alternative. Be or if, you don't, if you're not smart enough. And if you don't have enough integrity or, yes. if you don't have enough, or if you don't have a moral compass, these are all... Or if you're an arsonist. It takes no skill to burn stuff down. Building this studio that we're in took a lot of time and planning, mm. but I could get a bunch of 14-year-olds. And vision. Yes, I can get a bunch of 14-year-olds with hand mm -hmm. grenades and lighter fluid, and this yeah. place would be down in five minutes. There's a difference between asking questions and having a vision. Yes. and One has momentum. Yes, and asking questions is, of course, great. That is what built the West, the right. Socratic method. The, idea, the, the, the fruit of the Enlightenment is free inquiry, and we mm -hmm. should defend that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if your inquiry is rooted in, I'm going to do everything I can to weaken and or destabilize the thing. Right. You're not actually asking questions. Right. No, your goal is then to obliterate. Yeah, your, this is entropy. You are yes. like, you are epitomizing entropy. And, and I always say to the deconstructionists, what have you ever built? And the answer is nothing, because they don't seek to build. Right, again, they're asking you, questions, but they're not their actually Because their worldview is not, is not rooted in they don't have creation. Because really? creation is really hard. Right, right. It's hard to build families. It's hard to build cities. It's, if you go to the third world, it's not hard to destroy. Right. 
And you yeah. see that in every possible war zone. So I hope that... But you look at how powerful... I love this. This is a fascinating... Okay. I, I love this conversation. But you look at how powerful building is, right? Because if you take, like, let's say, what you've done in the last 11 years, it's a monumental and amazing, yes. right? And you look at what somebody, somebody tries to take down, and it just doesn't have the... It just doesn't have the um, power. Like yes. building something is an, an incredible force. And so I think when I look at the momentum of those two things and I look at what certain people are trying to do to the country versus what is emerging, which is people that believe and have values and have visions and build, yes, is like this Elon. will win. Like Elon, like this will win. I, I Th this I hope force so. is like, this is like almost the force of love versus the force no, of fear, course. right? Yes. They feel like completely different. And, and this is where like, you know, God wins in the end, love wins in the end, I right? Like, I agree. And I mean, so for, put aside the skill or the complexity because I, I could get a group of teenagers and fly them to Florence and it would take them 10 minutes to destroy the statue of David. Yeah. But none of them could build it. <laughs> exactly. Right? So the, we should win, but there's no guarantee in the short term we will. And the 20th mm. century is the example of that. I don't that. know. I think it is. I, I, I mean, yeah, okay. There's no guarantee I, of I have anything. a very low view of human nature. <laughs> I do. And now, where's the pessimistic in well, you? It, it, Where does this come from? It's not well. Um, for, for, for partially my religious views. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I live to be disappointed because I think that that human beings are rather primal at our core. I do. I, I don't think we're naturally good. That's 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 my God. I actually think the opposite. Yeah. I actually think that you know you were saying earlier about uh, you know. I'm going to use my words, like through our certain lens, we can justify any certain behavior and it could say that it's, it's, it's okay or it's just how I am or I believe in the good in this. It's like I actually believe that everyone does see life through their own lens and that everyone is unique and that probably even to, some, even to the extent that someone, say someone murders someone, right? They come up to the window, they, like, oh, they get scared, they shoot them, right? That person may be scarred from something they experienced young in their life or something they've seen where they go into an emergency sort of trigger response or they are like, I have to protect my child. This is what I do. Something in them told them that that was a better option than the alternative. I actually think that inherently everyone is good but, but conditioned through their environment. And I love psychology. So, okay. so I don't then know. why do we have to teach kids goodness? Do you? Yes. I have a daughter. What do you, is she inherently? Manipulating, lying. You don't think that she gets any of that from the proxy? So How did I teach her they that? Say that? They say that the, that the subconscious, which operates 95% of our life, the program that is run, is, starts to be established in the last trimester in the womb up until about six or seven years old is when the when your subconscious is programmed. So who's to say that she didn't hear, see, feel, get something programmed within her that happened at any one of those points that you think, well, she didn't hear that, she didn't know that. She could have literally been in the womb. This is so, such like, these, these are the things that we don't completely understand as human beings, like when this happens. But the truth is, is you do have to teach them good, but why? Because we're not so good. I think it's because we pick up things along the way and we don't know. Okay. We just don't understand when that programming happens. Yeah, I, I think humans are more of a blank slate tilting towards bad. Again, my, my, my views of nature are rooted in, in scripture, but out, that outside, we, we look at, I'll give you, I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, have, you, have you heard of Yan Mi Park? She's terrific. Oh, she, yeah, she grew yeah. up in North yeah, Korea. Yeah, she has an incredible yeah. story. If human beings were naturally good, then her story would be tough to understand because she said they would just walk over, you know, bodies asking for money or food, and there's nothing inherent about them to save them. And she, she never learned either way, just, oh, that's just, you know, that's just a clump of cells, basically. In, in tribes of Africa, all the time they'll leave just babies by the fire if they're unwanted. So what I'm getting at is values that we it's values that we have to try to pass down. I think left to our own devices, we're, as Thomas Hobbes would say, nasty, brutish, and short to one another. I think we're <laughs> awful. 
I, I don't think human beings are naturally. Look at the 20th century. Over it used to be much more brutal. You know, 120 million people died under the guise of doing good. Yeah. I, I, you have more hope in humanity. I don't. Mm. I, I, you know, it's very interesting. I'll, uh, and again, I totally respect your views because it's rooted in optimism, which I love. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Charlie, how could you still believe in God after the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Sure. And I said, well, I still believe in God. I just don't believe in humanity. Well, what is God then? This is an interesting way okay. to get into the conversation yeah, sure. about religion because I know it's very important yeah, it, to it you. It is, and, yeah, it is. And it's a, right. it's a core tenets of your sure. being and, and, your, and your moral compass and, and why you do what you do. The, the big question that launched me into, just as my background goes, I really didn't have, didn't go to church growing up. At one point in time, became a Catholic, then went to Baptist church, then got much more into spirituality. So I would call myself what, what would be, I don't even know if it's an actual um, term, but an omnism, which is the belief that there no one religion is true, but there's truth in all of them. I, I, I generally am very curious about the nature of God and what that is. So that was the first question that really dove me into excavating more of the nature yeah. of reality and spirituality. And so what is God? That was the question that sure. I was answering. I, uh, I believe in the God of the Christian Bible, or you could say the Old and New Testament, uh, which is a God who's omniscient, omnipotent, um, all-knowing. Uh, in the scriptures, there is a phrase, I am who I am. So it transcends time, transcends being. Um, in Christianity, we believe God manifests in three separate ways, the Spirit, um, the Father, and the Son. Um, but God is love at its mm -hmm. core, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we see that. I'm happy to explain, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, if you'd I'd like. Yeah, I keep going. In the scriptures, we, we say that, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God predated creation. Creation was an act of will by God. Um, he created what we know as the natural world. He created all the physics, the DNA, and then, of course, he created humanity. Um, we see this play out where God has many, um, let's just say, attempts at, trying to get humans to live morally, whether, you know, consciousness didn't work out very well in, you know, divine revealing teaching to Noah, um, to the Noahic covenant eventually, to the trans transmission law, to um, Moses on Mount Sinai. And essentially, <laughs> the story of the Old Testament can be really summarized in lots of um, rebellion, lots of strife, lots of struggle, and kind of perpetually, um, perpetual struggle where the New Testament picks up and changes the whole ballgame, which makes Christianity different than any other world religion. And again, I have total respect for all people's views, but I would say Christianity is different, and I believe is true, is that Christianity argues that we do not ascend to God, but God descended to us, where God actually took human form. Um, Buddhism, for example, would never grasp this because they believe human beings to be so you know, dirty, so separate from the divine, that the divine mm -hmm. actually taking temporal earthly flesh it would be a foreign concept to mm -hmm. Buddhism. So we believe that Jesus came on a rescue mission, if you will. Um, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son that whoever lived in him shall not perish but have eternal life, as it mm -hmm. says in John 3.16. So um, the, love is a very important word. Uh, we overuse it in the West. There are four Greek words for love. And so I want people to try to entertain this for a second. There is storge, which is the love uh, in Greek, which would be between a parent and um, a child. There is phileo, which is brotherly love. Uh, so mm. like between friends, like very close, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly mm. love, phileo. Mm. Um, there is eros, where you get the word erotica, um, mm. where is a romantic love. And then there is agape, which is a completely different term mm. that we don't use in the yeah. West and we should, or yeah. in English which is sacrificial love. Ah. So let me repeat that verse by using a different word, agape, which means I love you so much, I will stand in front of the train for you. I will take a bullet for you. I will die for you. So imagine now for God so agape the world that he sent his one and only son. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden we in English speaking cultures can have a better understanding of the significance of that verse. So we believe in the incarnation, God took human form, which I understand is a faith you know, statement. Some people have trouble understanding it. But on, he lived a perfect life to show us how to live, committed miracles, did an amazing ministry, died an unjust death, and then defeated the cross after three days, um, defeated the, the grave after three days so that we may have life. 
most things in life you earn, this is the one thing you don't earn that's given to you for free, is purchased at the cross. Mm -hmm. And it's the ultimate sacrifice, because it goes back to normative Christian theology, which is that we are flawed, we are sinners, and that we are in need of a sinner, uh, we are in need of a salvation and redemption. Mm. I loved hearing all those so I, I can, ways I can, of, yeah. of, ta of hearing about love. I've heard some of those. I've heard of agape. I've heard of eros. I don't really know what they, I like can't identify the exact definition, but that was cool to hear that I know that language is such an important thing too in general and that there are other languages that do a better job of having far more Caption. variations of being able to uh, get, get, get across the exact feeling that you're looking to because there's more words for it. Um, trying to sort of like isolate more in on God, Jesus, love. So I'll just say what I think it Please. is because then I'll I'm see if it I'm resonates not offend, I'm not for you. At all. Trust, I, um, you could be as blunt as you want. Yeah, yeah, I know that about okay, you. I yeah. love that about yeah. you. This is this is the way it's supposed I, to be I'm, to have I'm a very conversation. Open, so yeah. Um, I think of it in the framework of energy. And so something that's omnipresent isn't is an energetic. It's available at all times, all places, right? Um, and that love, love is a uh, frequency as well. So it's like an energetic frequency. And that's why at certain times in your life, you're able to access that deep feeling, but it's only at an elevated state, right? It's only when you get your frequency higher, your energy higher, you feel something far more positive. You get into those elated, joyful states where you're overwhelmed by this feeling of could be called love. And so I think of God as an energy. And that's why it's omnipresent. And it can be within you mm -hmm. as the body, around your ka body, or, or even the ethereal, the energy, spirit, um, or beyond. So I don't believe that, but that's, an, I, that's very Eastern. It's a um, way to bring it into like a tangible. No, I, I hear you. I, and I've, um, I'm not by, by no means an expert. What, what makes Christianity different is that in that same uh, chapter, of John 3, it says that you must be born new. And so to use what your, your description, the energy or the life force enters you when you are born again with Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, Paul writes this extensively in the epistles where when you are born again, you're a completely new person. Um, and so yeah, I, I, I don't- Is he able to identify that that being born as a baby or being born at any point? Uh, it would be born, born again is the idea that you have one birth when you actually are born with your mother right. and you're born again when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right. Um, and so I haven't thought that deeply about the, the energy part of it, but um, I think in my view, God is bigger than just an energy force. Mm. God is a, an intimate creator who loves us and knows us. The scripture tells us that he knows how many hairs are in your head. He knows the plans that he has before you. I knitted you when you were in the womb. Um, but I'm sure energy is a component of God. I haven't thought that deeply about that, though. Well, this plays into a little bit of you thinking that inherently we're all bad and I think that we're all good and that they actually, it might be not an or but an and and that another belief, if you're looking more from a spiritual energetic perspective, is that, that source being a singularity, a single point, God, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, um, fraction, the Big Bang broke apart in an effort to know itself. It's, that's Kabbalah teaching, yeah. So, I'm familiar with it. And that we essentially all are the one, but a part of the one expressing. So, I, yeah, I don't believe that. So that we, and that we can't see ourselves in, in this individual way too. If you were just one, you couldn't really identify what was going on because it's just you. Same thing actually with our human experience. Like I actually see myself through you. You're mirroring, your, I, when I'm triggered, mm -hmm. I know now something about myself. When I get excited, mm -hmm. I know something about myself. This is all information about myself. I can't actually see myself, but this is why as we get older and go through time, we rec start to recognize patterns and we start to recognize when we have reactions to things. We don't when we're young because we're so in it, but then as soon as we sort of pull back and like get a little bit more perspective, a little bit more calm, a little bit more patterning, we can see it mm -hmm. because we're seeing it as a reflection from someone else. It's interesting. I have to think about that. Do you like psychology at all? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I think most of it is bunk, but I, I do. I do like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of just 
like treachery that's happened in, in my modern psychology. It's, but well, it's fair because it's ex it's fair to say that because that that the reason why I feel like this conversation ended up going in this direction is because we're talking about colleges and you're talking about. Yes you know, professors that get these different ideas that are, you know, they deconstruct and, and you know, there's a lot about what I'm talking about that would sort of point in the direction of deconstruct down yes. to... Well, and I mean, just all, not, not all ideas are made equal, right? And so, like, child sacrifice is wrong, but the Aztecs would disagree. Right. So, I mean, at, at some point you have to develop a hierarchy of, of morals and values. And I, I would right. say about, you know, in, in Christianity, just to be clear, that we were made good, but in normative Christian theology that there was a decision made in the garden to rebel, mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm sure you know this, the audience mm -hmm, does, mm -hmm, which, mm -hmm. and at that moment there was a, man's heart was wicked from the time he was born, as it says later in you know, Genesis mm -hmm. 6 or 7, which I, I do believe plays out. Um, I do believe that we're awfully treacherous. Now some people would take, hey, we're, we're a little, I think we have good in us. I think that there are elements of goodness that can pop up, I mean, as, you know, de as destructive as my daughter can be, she can be super sweet and angelic at times, right? But we're talking about what is your fundamental nature absent, you know, teaching of values, absent education. And, um, I, I do believe it's, I would say, the word sinful mm -hmm. from, from mm -hmm. our birth. Where do you think, uh, value-wise, we, getting back to more of an overall country perspective and how this country should be run, um, and how you believe it should be, I should say. Like, where have we lost our way? What are the values that have been lost that are, are leading us so astray? This will sound like overly religious, okay. but I think I would love anyone even not religious to tell me why this is a bad list, the Ten Commandments. It's very simple. Yeah. And you shall have no other gods before me. You might say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, sort of, think about it. Are there some things that should be left holy in your life? Are there some things that should be prioritized? Right? You should not make any craven images. You should honor your mother and father, so mm -hmm. you live long in the land of which you are in. You shall not murder. You shall not covet. You shall not steal. I think these are rather good pillars for a society. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, which politicians do for a living. And so we need rules for life. Jordan Peterson has really ran with this idea and done yeah. it really well. And we currently don't have an agreed upon central moral contract yeah. in the West. Yeah. It used to be the Ten Commandments. If you walk into the halls of Congress, literally back in the 1800s, they built all of this, like Moses is in the Capitol Rotunda where they do the votes. Back in the 1800s, they built it there. Moses of the Ten Commandments. And because mm -hmm. he was the administrator of the law, right? He was the, he was the transmission, the, the law which was transmitted through Moses. So I think it's a great list. Yeah. I, I think that it's also built the West. So if you have a better list, I encourage people to send it to me. So this beautiful civilization we have was, was really foundation, the foundation was the Ten Commandments. I agree that rules are necessary, and I'll give you my experience of it. Have you heard of Burning Man? Oh, yeah. I, I have no plans to, I to, to go. I can't imagine you'd want to go to Yeah, that's man. like not my scene. At all. I'm, that's okay. Um, <laughs> See, I don't care about people's private lives. It's exactly. Like whatever. Right. Do um, you, man. Yeah. So I've gone the last couple of years, and um, what is crazy about it is you'd probably think to yourself, Burning Man, anything goes. That place has got to be wild, like no rules at all actually the rules that create the freedom. It's this amazing dichotomy of a situation or paradoxical situation where there's these 10, I think there maybe is 11 now, but there's these basic 10 rules that you have to abide by. Um, one that always feels very um, uh, current and like you have to think about all the time is let's say there's no littering and leave no trace is essentially what it's, it's written as. And it's crazy, there's nothing on the ground. For the, you don't find any, you're not even allowed to dump water on the ground. Like unless it's, you, you can't do anything. So you don't, there's no cups anywhere. You have to bring your own cup to some, for someone to pour in. Like it's these, and there's obviously many others that are important, including respecting others, you know, and what they want to do and, you know, very. Consent. Consent, I'm sure of is course, part of is, it. consent yeah. is definitely one. So, but it's these 10 rules that create this incredible freedom to anyone, for anyone to be the by themselves, be themselves. And um, so it That's was- powerful. It, it really the, is. And in this, uh, what you'd think would be absolutely obscene environment. But without the rules, no, how would it be? 
I think it would be chaos. Mess, yeah. Exactly. So there you go. You get, exactly. You need order for liberty. And exactly. And we've lost the order so we don't have liberty. Mm-hmm. And he, the, again, I'm not that familiar with Burning Man culture, but <laughs> it's 11, not 1,011 rules. Yeah. And the more, the more laws, the less justice. Again, mm-hmm. if it was 1,011 rules, you'd be like, forget it. I, I, Probably. No one would be like, excuse me, and then, you, then it creates many what I call micro tyrants. This is what happened during COVID, right? Probably, yeah. So then you have all these people that enforce Rule 888. But a crisply written list that everyone can look at, remember, yeah. and abide by. Digestible, too. Who enforces them at Burning Man? Oh, there are um, rangers everywhere. Really? Mm-hmm. So the police, there's rangers that, uh, that 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 do the eleven that and enforce. each other. That's the that's the answer I was and looking for. And each other. Yeah. So the, in so the, within like your own camps, yeah. there's a lot of accountability. So in the scriptures, there was a time when the Jews lived in the wilderness for four hundred years without a standing army or police force, and they all self enforced the ten commandments. Exactly. The, the law was at the center of society, and like these are our rules. Yep. And if you don't follow them, we're going to then. You know, punish you. Yep. Like if you violate one of these ten rules, yeah. and so I think that you need you need rules. You need a moral centeredness. We don't have it in our in our society right now. So I, I love that example. It, it yeah, because it's point. so extreme. Right? Well, no, it proves my point because yeah. it's like these are people in the state of nature, literally, right? That's right. There's nothing. Else. But you do need rules. That's exactly you can't, right. You can't you can't even be in the state of nature and just be like you know pure anarchy. Because we're all inherently bad. It, <laughs> That it proves my point. See, I'm, I'm like open to it. It proves my I, point I, I because does, it does, it does. if we, absent rules are something transcendent, mm-hmm. something that you believe there's a punishment for, then someone might go and steal or someone might violate the consent or they may, you know. So that, that does prove my point, which is, and so Thomas Hobbes, who came up with this view of nature, there's three social contract theorists, which you have... Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Locke, and Thomas Hobbes, and they were all like within a short period of time. And they all had three different views of human nature in nature. So I'll get to Hobbes the last because I agree with him the most. But the first is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed that human beings were naturally born good and corrupted as they grow up. Okay, and He's my guy. <laughs> yeah, he did, he, he did influence Marxism. So, uh, oh, shit. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm not, it's interesting because if you think about it, you could easily become a Marxist, not you, because then you have to blame something for why people are bad. They blame capitalism, they blame society. I'm not uh, saying you do, but... This it, is where I have the Buddhist approach, where I realize that the only way to fix it is myself. Yeah, and so then you so you have... Simil- Rousseau was right about a lot, but Marx was a huge Rousseau guy. He was like, mm. oh my goodness, totally true. So Rousseau would value the primitive over the civilized, the infant over the adult. Then you have John Locke, who believed in something, and I'm going to butcher the Latin, tabula rasa, which basically is blank slate. You're neither good nor bad at birth, and you're completely formed by your environment or the values. And then you have Thomas Hobbes, who wrote a book called The Leviathan uh, during the English oh. Civil War. Oh. And so you understand, everyone is always a product of their environment. I do agree with that. Yeah. And so we should just try to create a good environment, which yeah, is exactly. why I try to do that. Thomas Hobbes grew up in one of the bloodiest times in European history, right? Ah. It was the English Civil War. All he knew was bloody death destruction. And so he wrote in The Leviathan that human nature was nasty, brutish, and short. He's like, human beings are awful because he saw people do the worst things, human, you know, decapitations and rapes and kidnapping. And meanwhile, Rousseau lived like an opulent life in Geneva, Switzerland, and really didn't have much stress or pressure. It would be, it, it, you, you could believe that, you know, everyone's naturally good and all that. So I'm not saying that everyone who believes in that does, but those are basically the three social contract theories. Okay. That, yeah. uh, so my viewpoint is that absent rules. So Thomas Hobbes came to the conclusion, if you do not have strong order, people are going to rip each other apart. And I got to be honest, Annika, look at San Francisco. Look oh, at yeah. Chicago. Oh, man. And there might be something to, you know... The what sub- happens when you take police away? No, exactly. And there might be something like the subconscious molded them and all that. But even more so, I think it's less about their environment that creates crime, and it's more about who they naturally are within them. Meaning that if you don't, what, what do you do if you think you can get away with it? I have a theory that human nature is to do the minimum. To be lazy. Do whatever the minimum is. So if I were to tell you about my childhood, my dad was incredibly hard on me. He, there was a lot of discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my minimum was high, it felt like, right? Someone else's minimum. I think this is why sometimes in like generational wealth families you see 
less and less ambition at times because the minimum gets lower, right? There's always a there's always a catch net. That's right. There's really nothing they have to do, right? This is just an, just an example. Um, but I, I do have the belief that human nature is to do the minimum. Yeah, and I... Like I, deadlines, right? Like the deadline is over 100%. here, so you wait for it, right? Well, and again, I, just so everyone understands my view on human nature, how did I come to this? Well, spending time around so many high school and college kids, mm. you realize that unless you repeat it and discipline on it and mm. repeat it and discipline on it, then a behavior is formed, mm. right? And so but that is how you create programming. Yeah, that's no, how you sub program. The and not all programming is bad. I no. mean, I'll give you an example. So, um, if you take a child like my twenty-month-old, she has no manners. I hope to program manners. <laughs> right. No, th sure. right. I mean, sure. she doesn't use the restroom. Sure. She doesn't, you know. She drools. <laughs> exactly. So some programming is actually really good. It keeps yeah. us free yeah. because without that, it would be like a super unpleasant society, right? <laughs> Everyone would smell all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but some programming can be super bad. Yeah. Uh huh. That's exactly right. So then you have to decide 100%. what is good or bad. Yeah. And that, that's what we're here. So how do we establish the right framework moving forward with our country based on sort of where we've gone astray? Like, what do, what do we need to do and who do you think is going to be able to accomplish that job in the best way? Well, I think it's Trump right now. I think we're in a total crisis. Um, I think the civilization is in free fall. And I just ask people this, put, put aside everything you think about Donald Trump. Were the four years under Trump, were, we, were you making more money, more stable, were you flourishing greater, or did we have more peace, which is a moral good, or the four years of Joe Biden? And it's not even a question. Not I can go question. through three. Economically, we were better. Foreign policy, we were better. And we were better at the border and or you know, immigration sovereignty issues. You can put all your other t opinions aside. I don't think they matter nearly as much. With Joe Biden, your dollar is worth less and inflation has crushed people. Foreign policy, we have wars with Russia and Ukraine. We have wars with Israel, Gaza, and possibly Iran. China is on the march. The, the world is, the planet is literally falling apart. And then finally, the border, we have 10 to 15,000 people a day coming across the southern border. And so, like, I'm not the one that says that Trump is going to heal the country, but he might save the country. Mm -hmm. Every president has a role to play. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump goes in to break things mm -hmm. and to change standard operating procedure mm -hmm. and, you know, the order in front of us. Mm -hmm. And I find the accusations that people throw against him to be silly and short-sighted. And we don't have to wonder what type of president each person running is. We now know. That's true. It's the first time in American history where you can see these four years versus this four years. Which one? Usually it's this four years against somebody's vision or two visions. Mm -hmm. running against one another. No, this time it's totally different. It's four documented years, four documented years. And, and Donald Trump's, the country was in a far better spot. I want to get that back. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, why do you think that Trump, do you, uh, first off, do you think that Trump was really elected president last time, but was in cheated through the yeah, I, I think voting he, system and through mail-in, through, through mail -in manipulation? Probably. The one I focus on is the manipulation of consumption of information, where Twitter colluded with the FBI and we weren't allowed to talk about the Hunter Biden laptop, and the social media companies suppressed any sort of dissident information. Mm -hmm. that, that alone was information warfare. Right. The entire election was decided by 41,000 votes. Uh, we had the highest voter turnout that we had in 60 years. Well, Trump got even more votes than he did the that, year before. Right. The, the term before. That's correct. It was 20 million more votes cast than any other election in American history. Hmm. And we had, let me get this right, 156 to 160 million total votes cast, and the election is decided by 41,000 votes. Before we get into man And how many balloting, people have come across the border? Are we at, what yeah, are we at, 12 uh, million well, right now? Yeah, that we know of. Yeah, I think it's like nine and a half million. It's going it's to be an influential <laughs> amount of votes. Yep. If, Thank if, God people have to use their IDs now, right? Isn't with, that a new with, rule finally? Well, it depends. Or you have to have proof of citizenship, which oh, is separate. Mm, but shit, are they going to get that? Uh, <laughs> it depends on what state, not in California. I mean, do you think this is part of why the, the border, not border is open no, to I, manipulate I, the I, I voting? Don't, I don't think there's a lot of illegals that are currently voting, but I do think it changed the, changed the demographics, and I think that their kids become citizens immediately. Because, you know, if you have 9 million people and they have four kids per family, you're talking about four, 36 to 40 million people. Yeah. Right? So then, and then all of a sudden, now, mind you, Hispanics aren't a monolith. A lot of Hispanics are voting Republican, voting conservative. They want a free society. But they generally do end up voting more Democrat than Republican. But it's more than that. It's, it's an intentional, what's called a cloward piven strategy. These were two political philosophers and thinkers in the 70s that said you destroy America by three things. <laughs> do three things. And they were Marxists. They were communists. Again, you can look it up. Your audience can fact check me. Cloward Piven strategy. You destroy America through destroying the currency so you borrow a bunch of money that you don't have. You build a fourth branch of government that is a, a, a deep state bureaucracy. And then you overwhelm the country with third worlders 
and you effectively destabilize the public infrastructure and the trust of the culture in the country. So you're living through all three of those right now. Wow. That seems pretty cut and dry. Yeah. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> Actually, that reminds me of something that people talk about. I, I personally don't see how Trump does not become president. Oh, I, I, and, I see how he can. <laughs> but one of the questions is, do you think he, that they, they, they would murder him? Oh, yeah, they, they might, yeah. I, I, I think that assassinations post Bobby Kennedy are logistically harder, A, because of Secret Service protection, and B, I think that- But he doesn't have it. Well, Trump has it, but not Oh, sorry. They, they might RFK. try to kill RFK, too. Yeah. But, but Trump has Secret Service protection. I mean, of course they might try to murder him. I mean, what, what else do they have left? And people will say, oh, they're not gonna try. I mean, assassination is built into the history of the West, from Julius Caesar to Abraham Lincoln, to JFK, to Bobby Kennedy, to MLK, to Malcolm X, they were all assassinated. We have not had a successful high-profile assassination since Bobby Kennedy. We've had the last successful presidential um, attempted assassination was Ronald Reagan when he was president, I think in 1982 or 83. And I think that the people, I, I believe the government killed JFK, for the record. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think that's up for debate. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. But I think that the government would rather assassinate you financially, reputationally, than put a bullet in you. Because I think that what comes next, it, the destabilization that would follow, I think, mm. they don't want. It's, it's, it's a cleaner kill for them to you put Trump in jail. You think that because people would, okay, to put him in jail, or, or to, to, get, just, to or, get the or to population to, to, yeah, exactly. They or would. to have him lose, right? Because theoretically, if Trump were to be assassinated, God forbid, I hate even talking like this. Right, right. I, I can't imagine that the country will be stable the next day. I pray it would be, but I mean, you have 30 to, you have probably 15 million people that look to Trump and they're like, this is the one vessel that we believe that can save the country. Yeah. And if that too gets robbed from them after their factory jobs got robbed from them and if their best friend overdosed on fentanyl, I'm not sure what comes next would be pleasant. And I hope it would be. I don't want unrest. I think it's awful. So I think the intel agencies know that. I, I think that the people that are the masters of society, um, but they might get desperate and they might put a bullet in them. I hope not. I pray not. I mean, as far as an ideal outcome in the end, Trump president then. Yeah, and that's just the beginning of the Who's fight. He, what about his VP? Uh, we'll see. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard's getting talked about here. I, I see some goods and bads. It looks good and bad about that. Um, but I, I think that it would be a formidable ticket. Um, I was kind of hoping for for RFK, if he like as an option, but no, he, I had, love he had some. He didn't. Nicole didn't. Shanahan. He went way to the left. But <laughs> he I think, did right. I, I think didn't RFK, he just post some some social media posts yeah, like just, coming down on? No, it's totally crazy. Yeah. Um, I actually love that RFK. Because a lot of people that were going to vote for him were probably quite Republican. Correct, and that were upset about the COVID stuff, and you didn't like Trump's embrace right. of the vaccine and all that. Um, I think that RFK is running for the Democrat nomination in 2028. And that's my current theory is that he wants to try to rebuild the Democrat Party as being an old school Democrat Party, which I think would be a great thing I was going to say, I think that's not, a bad, not a, a bad thing. It would be a moral good for the country. I wouldn't agree with them on everything, but at least I'd be like, okay, if they ever got their hands on power, they wouldn't destroy this place, <laughs> right? You know, like a Democrat Party that believes in borders. They might have differences of me on abortion, but like they're going to be de-radicalized in that. They don't want the trans stuff. Like, you know, the Democrats of the 60s or 70s, I think that would be great. Um, yeah. So I think Bobby Kennedy's, if that's his goal and his, his um, mission, I think that's great. Who Trump should pick, I don't know. I like J.D. Vance, he's from Ohio. Probably makes sense to have a female, uh, given some of the dynamics that Trump is up against. Um, because he's criticized so much for things. Oh no, like just a, you know, abortion and the female vote is gonna be so powerful and mm. so potent. I think that um, you know, we as conservatives or free thinkers do believe in biological differences between men and women. Um, and I so, definitely do. Yeah, I know, exactly. Like I this, love those, when you go oh, to campuses you, yeah. and you're like, what is a woman? And they're like, well, it's like, <laughs> this shouldn't be hard. No, this, this shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> so I, um, yeah, look, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what he ends up choosing or selecting. I, I have no special insight, but I hope he chooses Vivek? somebody. Where, did, where does he I, come into the picture? I would love a vague. I don't, I don't know if he's currently in the running, unfortunately, yeah. I would love to see someone, though, that's chosen for their merit, not just for what box that they, they select. Well, then it can't be a girl, because you're saying it's for a box, then. Well, but no, there's plenty of qualified girls. Yeah, of course. I mean, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, you know, there's so many that are terrific. So, yeah. uh, Christine Noem is great. So, I just, I want someone who is the most qualified, and if they happen to also, you know, choose a box, then, or pick a box, then that's fine. 
What about you in the future? I mean, there's there's no way oh that you haven't gosh. either been asked or thought about. I'm not running for political, political office, office no. in any way. I love what I get to do. I get to speak my mind. I, okay, Tucker Jr. <laughs> I also love organizing, though, too. So I love the turning point side of it. And so, yeah, but if I can have the impact of a Tucker or of a Rush, what a great life to live. In some ways, you're more impactful than politicians. You can speak your mind. That's true. You could spend time with your family every night. You could travel. Like Being a politician feels like so dirty and just like, ugh. What, what? You know, I'd rather have other people go do that. After I, um, I, I agree, I, after meeting Bobby and um, you know, spending a little bit more time with him, I saw him over... New Year's and he got this harebrained idea that I should run for Congress and told Amaryllis who works with him to talk to me about it and so I had a phone call and she was like have you called me last night he's like have you talked to Danica yet and I was like this is the most crazy idea I have ever heard but when she was explaining the whole situation about why you do it and the history of politics and especially in a more local way, um, is that it's, it's generally just people speaking up for the community and what they believe. And that after, of course, I was like, yeah, there's a very low likelihood, no, I'm not going to do this, is that you know, people would say, those, they would say, that's exactly why you should. The reason why I know. you should is because you don't want to. I, I, I find it just to be repulsive. Like, to have to go to be DC. Tucker says the same thing. I mean, he literally says, like, I hate politicians, I think I've heard him say. Yes. I mean, there's some that I like, but they're very rare. Do you think that every politician is a narcissist then? No, I don't think so. I think yeah. there's some really decent people that end up running. I think they're, they're majority narcissists. Some are sociopathic. Some are like the five foot eight version of the student council president that always wanted to be important. In fact, that's like a majority of DC. They're all short. <laughs> no, I'm just, I mean, again, I'm kind of tall. I, like, I'm nothing against short people. You are. You what, 6'2"? No, no, no. I'm six, like 6'2", six, six, whatever. Yeah. I, I, but no, I will say, nothing against short people. I, I have something against short men who wish that they were tall and they're bitter that they're not tall. Yeah, of course. Right? Of course, I think you agree. Men. That's a psychological exactly, problem. Exactly, exactly. What would you, I mean, being close to, to Trump, it feels like his seemingly narcissistic way of communicating and the way that he delivers can be a very big turnoff. And I find that, even in my experience, it seems to be a really big turnoff for women, especially. It yes. seems like a very big trigger for them. Um, and that if you were just trying to volume down, like, I was, I was like, if it would have been down like 20%, he would have been fine. I'm going to click and this. And I feel I'm like it it's him. down. I'm going to say, Mr. President, Danica has a message for you. And, and I feel like it's down a look, little, but would you recommend that to I, him? I, for I, I don't know, because look, I, he knows his base really well. What some would call narcissism, other people call confidence. <laughs> I get it. Right? I get and it. So, I get it. And I, I, I'm kind of out of the world of like Trump should improve because like the man is facing 700 years in federal prison and like I would probably be acting crazy. I would say this though that, and I'm not saying he's acting crazy, but like however people portray he it, could, right? Yes, yeah. I, here's what I will say is that um, if it's less about how people view Trump's behavior and more about the excellent job he did as president, okay. I think it's I think it's a blowout. It's a no-brainer. And I have no idea. Okay, people ask me all the time, Charlie can get Trump. I just come. No, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't get him to do it. I'm sorry. But I will defend him. And I think he was. I, here's what I will say is that I, I go on so many of these shows and people talk about all the negative stuff about Trump. He has some amazing virtues. And mm -hmm. if you're raising a child and they say, well, well, yeah, I want a president that my child can look up to. Like, okay. So you want like a boring cutout, like a corporate shill? Or do you want someone that when their back is against the wall, that they keep on fighting and they keep on slugging. Mm. I, I think that's amazingly appealing. I think it's virtuous, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I hear you, Danica. I hear from women all the time. If yeah. he would just, if he would yeah. just, like, I don't get triggered. You, you know what by I say him, is, I got nothing for you. Yeah, I'm sorry. exactly. Like, I, I got nothing. And I, I'll say, he can fix the country. You know what I'd say? <laughs> That it probably has to do with some of their past experience in their life. That Danica, you the said programming. it. Uh, <laughs> the psychology it. of it. Uh, if I uh, say that, <laughs> woo! No, it's totally, it's in that, and that's why I think it's more of a female trait to be triggered because it's, a, it's a more manipulation and it's, it tends to be a more mass, it's, men embody more narcissism because they are bosses and in charge and, and it's just kind of like the less connected to their feelings, women are more. There's just generalities with men and women and how it would go, and I think that's why. So I would say that it probably is because some of their programming gives them access to information about themselves be, that they have again, had. Again, I would experience. use the word confidence. I want someone with confidence when they're dealing with Xi Jinping. 
Amen. Right? I want someone who believes in themselves, who can assert himself. I'm with you. I'm with you. And I'm also with you if you uh, go down the political route or oh, no. maybe speaker of the house. Like, is there like oh, a goodness. role for no, a really no. incredible speaker? I, if, no? If I can just have an impact that reaches millions of people every day. Maybe someone that has integrity to run the either RN, run the RNC, no, right? Not, I'm no, I'm not doing that. No. No. I, I want to build some, I'm an entrepreneur. I love building. I love taking risks. I also, I can't censor myself. I just, I can't do that. I just tell the truth. And I feel like we're making an impact, I okay. think. Okay. As a last question yes. then. How do you want to be remembered? I know you're very young and you've oh, accomplished yeah. a lot, but I think this will, this is like Write an end tombstone. of life. Back. Yeah, like how yeah. do you want to, you know. Uh, faithful Christian. Um, Loyal husband, good father, and a proud patriot. That's my tombstone. Go put it on there. <laughs> truth teller. And truth teller. Yeah, at the bottom. Yeah. Truth teller. I like it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.